I asked our provost, uh, Mark Sargent, what should I omit from his introduction? And he said, just say, just say the provost is here. He's going to speak to you. But I can't just say just that about him. He's a man who has brought so much uh, to this college. Uh, great experience uh, and great wisdom as a, as a result of this great experience and a, a lot of good humor. He works very hard. You don't see the half of what he does, but we're grateful for you, Mark. And uh, maybe you want to give a one-liner when you get up here on just what is a provost? I say he's provost, and people say, oh, yeah, oh, good. Uh, just give us a one-line definition. Anyway, let's welcome uh, Dr. Mark Sargent, our provost. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. Uh, I may have told you heard me tell this story before, but when my... Um, Mother heard that I was named a provost. She said, congratulations. She called me back the next day and said, I looked it up in the dictionary. It's a church official or a jailer. Mm -hmm. I said, that's right. Mm -hmm. Actually, the provost is a long historic term, but it's the chief academic officer of the institution. Uh, well, good morning. Uh, let me begin by congratulating the women's soccer team for wrapping up the conference title yesterday. <laughs> And to Brooke Lillywhite, who scored five goals. That's a Westmont record, and it would be more points than I would get on a Telford work exam. <laughs> uh, I hope Brooke takes some time to celebrate, indulge herself, like take a six-minute shower or something like that. I am sure there are some disappointed San Francisco Giant fans here this morning. <laughs> Game seven, nine. but 10 to nothing. Mm. That was like Halloween nightmare. It came a little bit early, so. As you know, uh, Friday is Halloween. Ben alluded to it. It is All Hallows' Eve. That's where the term comes from. The Eve of All Hallows' Day, which is better known as All Saints' Day. Uh, ben led us in that litany. Uh, and gave us a perspective on the long history of faith, uh, the perseverance on the part of many patriarchs and matriarchs, even when they, their destination was uncertain, their perseverance. And All Saints is a day when many Christian denominations very sol solemnly recognize that long history. But in some traditions, it's also a day when they recognize the the many saints that are alive and in their community as part of that. Ben gave us an image of us all really being in one community together, that great cloud of witnesses. Now, I love the sense of history. I, I'm, I love traveling and seeing old cathedrals. I love old manuscripts. I love reading about uh, uh, historic figures and, and their contributions. It kind of reflects my more reflective uh, sensibility. I like that sense of lingering in the past. But my perspective has been profoundly changed and, and shaken in recent years just by the realization of what is happening in the church around the world. Uh, the story of Christianity is indeed one of longevity, 2,000 years, and all that precedes it in the history of the Hebrews. But it is also one of breadth, the expansion of global Christianity. And today, as we anticipate All Saints Day, I want to take a look around and see that breath, even as we look back. We're going to focus on both the living and the dead. And that, that focus encourages me to start with a very interesting quiz for you. I'm a chief academic officer. I have to give you a test. Uh, so here's, here's the, the, the statement. Accurate or not, about 25% of the Christians who have ever lived are alive today. Too high? Anyone? Actually, too low. Almost half the Christians who have ever lived are alive. More than half the Christians uh, who have ever lived were alive in the last hundred years. Uh, I hope you can see the changes on the screen. I originally put them in in bright red, but then I changed them to maroon because I prefer maroon as a color. <laughs> Uh, 
you, you know that Global is one of our uh, Westmont's five planks. We encourage engagement with the world, global engagement with the academy, church, and world, as, uh, as we say in our mission statement. And certainly graduating with a, uh, a degree from a Christian liberal arts college should not only give you some sense of the history of faith, but also the scope of the Christian faith in this moment. A couple of decades now, when historians write of the history of Christianity, they will be talking a lot about the breadth of Christianity that began to emerge at this moment and the radical changes that the faith has undergone. Here's some quick data points, which I thought you might have interesting. I don't know if you can read the words uh, on this chart, but, but I'll summarize it for it. This is a snapshot of the Christian population of the world in 1910 and 2010. Now, the world's population has quadrupled during that time. The percentage of individuals in the world who are Christian has remained about the same, 33 to 36%. But if you can see the chart, you can see that there's a substantial difference in where they come from. In 1910, two-thirds of them came from Europe. Now, look at the proportion that comes from Africa, from Latin America, from Asia. We've really become a part of a global faith and, and not a Western faith. A few other facts uh, uh, demonstrate this uh, more clearly. Let's go to the next one. You all know the Anglican Church, Church of England. There are now more Anglicans worshiping on any Sunday in Kenya or Uganda than all the Anglicans in England, the Episcopalians in the United States and Canada combined. And neither Kenya nor Uganda comes close to Nigeria in the number of Anglicans. Go ahead. Missionary work is continuing, but so much of the missionary work is not Western going East or South. It's Asian and African ministry, missionaries coming back into our world. The largest number of Jesuits, Order of the Catholic Church, are in India. India has a long Christian history and percentage-wise, the largest number of, uh, of Jesuits in that order reside in India and have for over 100 years. There are more Catholics in the Philippines than in the historic countries, Catholic countries of Spain and Italy. Let's go forward. One out of every eight Christians comes from Brazil or Mexico. In the early 70s, the Christian church was illegal in China. Now it's quite possible, we don't have exact statistics on this, but it's quite possible that on any Sunday, there are more Christians worshiping in Chinese churches than in all of Europe combined. And the church in Korea has been an extraordinary story in the last uh, 30, 40 years there's actually one church with multiple services that has as many people worshiping as all the Presbyterians and Covenant uh, believers in the United States combined. We live in a world in which our faith has become extraordinarily global. Uh, and this presents some challenges and, and fantastic opportunities. There are lots of interesting themes that can be discussed when we talk about the global church. Some challenges, they're the challenges of syncretism. What happens when the faith moves to a different culture and blends with some of the traditions? And there's lots of controversies about that. Lots of challenges about interfaith dialogue. Lots of challenges about understanding how the Bible is going to be interpreted. What parts of the Bible take preeminence when people form policies and church practice and understand their doctrine. There are different ways of reading the scripture in different parts of it, all of which is fascinating and interesting. In some parts of the world, there's much greater emphasis on healing and on miracles, on the sense of living very close to the spirit world in our life, much so, more so than in the Western world. Now, as a, as a provost, as the chief academic officer, I'm hoping that Westmont students will be fascinated by these questions and want to explore these types of issues in 
in very scholarly and, and, and very research-oriented ways so that we come to understand uh, the, the global church that we're in. But my purpose today is to be less interested in the scholarship and in the spirit of worship to, to really focus on how my own recent belated discovery of how the church is changing around the world has enriched my own sense of spiritual life, growth, and worship. And as a common way of framing our worship together, we're going to look at some scripture. But we're going to do the scripture in a little different way this time. In the spirit of emphasizing the global church, I've asked six of our international students if they would come read our passages for us in their own language. And as you listen to the international students read, think this is just not a handful of individuals who are in a minority at a place like Westmont. In many ways, you're hearing the language of the worldwide church here in what they read and what they say in terms of the scripture. We've chosen two passages, one Hebrews 12, one and two, which is the, really the sequel, the, the, the capstone verses to Hebrews 11, which form the foundation of the litany that we read, about the great cloud of witnesses. And then the passage from Luke 24 about Jesus on the Emmaus Road, which is a metaphor that we do use at Westmont to talk about our engagement with the world in our service to, to the global society and the global church. So I'm, I'm going to invite all six of them to come up, and the words in English will be flashed on the screen and listen as they read in their own languages. Abe Blania. Sulea Kumine Bidi Kalina Fe, Tulina Olufu, Olaba Juliwa, Olwen Kanao, Olutreta Olo De, Tamblenga, Bolia Chizitoa, Nechibi Eche Gatana Fe, To Dukanga no Kugume Keriza, Okuakana, Okutende, Okuteke Dua, Momaso Gafe. Be the Medrio. 또 온전하게 신이 온전하게 하신 이 예수를 바라보자. 그는 그 앞에 있는 기쁨을 위하여 십자가를 참으사 부끄러움을 개의치 아니하시더니 하나님 보좌 우편에 앉으셨느니라. 저도この日2人の弟子がエルサレムから11km余り離れたエマオという村に行く途中であった。そして2人でこの1歳の出来事について話し合っていた。 Y aconteció que mientras hablaban entre sí y se preguntaban el uno al otro, Jesús mismo se acercó e iba con ellos juntamente. Pero los ojos de ellos estaban velados para que no le conociesen. Ngài hỏi, việc gì vậy? Họ thưa, đó là việc xảy ra cho Đức giê người Nazareth, một nhà tiên tri từ lời nói đến hành động, điều đầy quyền năng trước mặt Đức Chúa Trời và toàn dân. Thế nào các thượng tế và các nhà lãnh đạo dân ta đã giao nộp Ngài để xử tử và đóng đinh trên thập tự giá? Nae fe tuali te subira ntie alinola Israeli ate ne kubino byonna lero sine nakusatu ebigambo bino kasoke debi bao era nabakazi abamu abe wa fe batuuni ekiriza abake de okugenda kuntana we batasanze mulambo gwe ne bajja ne bagamba ansi balabye okolesebwa kwa ba malaika abagambye ansi mulamu Tu Riam Kenda Junge, Tu Sarmi Budomega, Quayan Jaza de Libalam Pavatemil Puafna, Yeton Boji Botan in Iraconel, Irishide, Bironago, Sanjay Valam Bodun Gothel Bame Todim in Chadrio. Kiristoa, Canarazu, Sonoyona Kirishmio Kete, Sorekara, Kareno Eko in Hide Hazde on Akatano Escap. 
それからイエスはモーセおよびすべての預言者から始めて聖書全体の中でご自分について書いてある事柄を彼らに解き明かされた。Y llegaron a la aldea donde iban y él hizo como que iba más lejos. Pero ellos insistieron diciendo: Quédate con nosotros, porque se hace tarde y el día ya ha declinado. Entró pues a quedarse con ellos. 到了坐席的时候，耶稣拿起饼来，注谢了，搬开，递给他们。他们的眼睛亮了，这才认出他来。忽然，耶稣不见了。Ngay giờ ấy họ đứng dậy, quay về Jerusalem, gặp mười một sứ đồ và các người khác đang tụ tập với nhau. Họ nói: Chúa thật đã sống lại, Ngài đã hiện ra cho Simon. Rồi hai môn đệ thuật lại việc đã xảy ra dọc đường và họ đã nhận ra Ngài khi Ngài bẻ bánh. Let's thank them for reading the scripture. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much.、Uh, in, in many ways, the Emmaus Road story is, is an interesting metaphor that I see in my own personal life, in the sense that I was walking a Christian journey. Not aware of just how much of the presence of Christ was walking alongside me in other parts of the world,、uh, and so c- coming to encounter, as I've had an opportunity in the last 10 or 15 years, more of that church worldwide. I want to focus on some ways in which it has enriched my sense of spiritual life. First is, I find renewal and inspiration when I see just how much the gospel thrives. And takes on new life and new cultures. In the West, we live in so we live with so many stories about decline, about the faith,、uh, perhaps fading within our culture. That there's something deeply inspirational about seeing the ways in which the body of Christ is growing worldwide. And to be in situations where you recognize anew the ways in which the Holy Spirit is working in different cultures is extraordinarily powerful. In many ways, what has become familiar to me in my own culture becomes new when I see it again in a different culture, and what is new becomes relevant to me when it echoes things that、uh, are familiar. There's a new vitality when we experience it in a new culture, and the vitality comes through even when we share texts and certain rites and rituals.、I'll、tell one story、uh, in about the year 2000. I was in Kenya. I was at a service of a, of a large number of Christian college students from Africa. They came from all over Africa. There had been a coup in the Congo. There were six students from the Congo. They did not know if their parents and families in the Congo were alive. They did not know the state of their families. They did not know the state of their country. And in a, a remarkable way that still moves me when I think about it,、uh, they brought the six students forward and prayed and sang. The rhythms, the sounds, the music, very African, very different. And, and I sensed、uh, a manifestation in the spirit with, with an energy and power which I had not had. But then, at a moment of, of real emotion in the service, they turned to the Lord's Prayer. And hearing the Lord's Prayer, which I had heard so many times, sometimes taken very routinely, said in a different context, embrace as our anthem of hope and petition at that time was enormously powerful. And I had a sense in which the Lord had made possible both the chance to expand across cultures, but to find common ground in His faith. A second important.、Uh, Theme for me is I'm, I'm very much inspired and, and reawakened to the fact that the gospel has so often prompted people to march towards justice and reconciliation throughout the world. We all know that there have been times in the history of the church when the church has been、um, an opponent of justice, or certain parts of the church have been an opponent of justice. We, we have our scars in our history. But encountering the global church, you discover so many stories of the work of good people, sometimes in quiet, diligent
uh, often ignored ways that have stood for the faith in moments of resistance, sometimes a great sacrifice to their lives and, and their fortunes, sometimes with a patient sense of, of really striving for peacemaking and reconciliation. Uh, in a few days, we're going to be recognizing worldwide the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. I had some correspondence recently with the Heckleys, Chris and Sherry Heckley, who lead that program. Uh, and they're, they're with a group of Westmont students there right now, visiting some of the sites that are associated with that peaceful falling of the Berlin Wall in 1989. And you know what the five most significant sites are that were identified by the German government as important for this? There were five churches. Five churches where the community of worship came together for prayer, for, for refuge, for conversation, and in a spirit of hope, striving for greater understanding in the world inspired some of the policies that led to the, the eventual decision to bring down the Berlin Wall. It's a much long process, a lot of historical circumstances led to that, but at the final moment, there were strong voices on the part of the churches in that effort. You have on your screen one of, one of the most interesting and fascinating historical sites that, that I've encountered. This is from Lithuania, I was there in 2006. This is a hill of crosses in Lithuania. It really started in the 19th century when, when a group of individuals in an affirmation of their faith began to place crosses on a hill. Uh, and eventually the crosses began to accumulate and various regimes took them down. These crosses began to emerge during the time that Lithuania was part of the, of the Soviet regime. Three times the hill of crosses was bulldozed and people went out and put crosses. They're, they're elegantly carved crosses, they're interesting sculptures, they're homemade crosses where people just put together sticks. And it was an affirmation in their way that the faith was going to endure and give them hope at a time when they were struggling for, for greater political understanding as well as spiritual understanding. Um, today, there are over 100,000 crosses on that hill. A fantastic testimonial to the persistence of faith among the people it's not a government monument that's the number one tourist site in Lithuania. It's this communal expression of faith. The third theme is, I'm increasingly inspired when I rediscover the power of the church to promote, promote knowledge and human understanding. In many ways, the academic world has underestimated the church. We've had lots of research efforts, lots of different uh, initiatives, all well-meaning to or most of them well-meaning, to try to bring about poverty reduction or try to bring about uh, clean water or try to bring about greater uh, flourishing throughout the world. And a lot of them have struggled. There's a lot of very high-priced uh, American grant-supported equipment that's gathering rust someplace in the world. Some of the significant breakthroughs have come when researchers and scholars have realized the great capital of trust that the church has built up with people around the world. Trust because they have cultivated a sense of care for the whole person, the spiritual being as well as the physical being. And in many ways, the way forward, I think, for a lot of us that are interested in working at ways to bring about uh, greater social justice, social entrepreneurship, <coughs> um, human well-being, is to understand the church, to partner with the church, to listen to the church in powerful ways. For my closing thought, I want to go back to that Emmaus Road image. You heard the passage read by the, the students, you saw it on the screen. When did they recognize Jesus? It wasn't when they understood the prophecy or their understanding uh, of history. Jesus had to give that to them on the road and they still didn't get it. When did they recognize Jesus? when he broke bread, when he broke bread. In many ways, I think that's an extraordinary image of the call on us as global citizens to go and break bread with believers around the world, understanding the ways in which their faith can renew us, inspire us, the ways in which our partnership can help them, and in ways in which we share a great communion that is appropriate for All Saints Day.
not just the long history, but this extraordinary wide history at this incredible moment in the history of the Christian faith. And Westmont is the kind of place that I would like to be right at the center of that movement and that expansion. So my prayer for you, my prayer for all of us, is that we will engage some of those difficult questions about the growth of the global church, about how our faith goes through changes. Be aware of some of the anxieties and dangers. Have good, hard, sometimes difficult conversations about about different political and theological dimensions, but that we bring at the same time an open heart to learn, to live with, and to grow from the presence of the Holy Spirit in the lives of so many saints worldwide. Let's pray. Lord, as we approach All Saints Day, make us more aware of our brothers and sisters, both in our own neighborhoods, on this campus, in our own congregations, but make us hungry to know the power of your work around the world. Give us open hearts as well as open minds to learn, to grow, to study, to discern, and to think more and more about how we can be the face of Christ to so many people in need. We ask all these things in the name of our Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.